Hey now, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and here we are at the top of my top 100 games of all time. My top 10 games of all time. We're counting down from number 10 to number 1. These are the games I absolutely love the most. From the first time that I played them, I was like, this is something special. And as I played them more and more, I was like, this game will always be in my collection. I can't foresee a time it won't be in my collection, and I will always, always, always want to play it. Now, what can you expect with this top 10, just to sort of prep you for this? There's gonna be a couple of games you're gonna be like, huh, really, that game, why? There's gonna be a couple like that, I'll warn you right now. There's gonna be some safe bets, there's gonna be some games you're like, oh yeah, totally understood, you know, that's, maybe they show up on a lot of other people's lists too, not a surprise at all. There's going to be a couple of games that will be a little bit surprising because you're like, oh, those are really new. I can't believe they made it that high on the list. But trust me, it's because they are so phenomenal. And there's one game that will be no surprise whatsoever. Without further ado, let's get right to it. And even for my top 10, I did not forget about the people from Board Game Geek. My number 10 game of all time to kick us off is a really good one. Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island from Ignacy Trebuchet and his company Portal Games. Now there's a lot of very difficult cooperative games on my top 100 list, but Robinson Crusoe may arguably, arguably even, be one of the toughest ones. But I don't mind that. And why don't I mind that? Because when you do finally win this game, or even when you, maybe you don't win, but you just do well, and you accomplish something in the game, it feels so fantastic. You jump out of your chair, you scream and you yell, you high five the people that you're playing with because you accomplished such a monumental thing. And it wasn't just some game mechanic that you managed to pull off that you know you were able to give yellow cubes to all of the players on your turn. It's that you're telling a story and your characters in the story did something really, really cool. Maybe they invented something that you've been working on and that you desperately needed and you finally got it done. Maybe you got enough food to feed everyone and you're not gonna starve for the night or you were able to put up a shelter or you explore this island and just found something amazing. You are telling a story with this game and it is tied so intimately to the mechanics that this has got to go down as one of the most thematic games ever. And that is just a one reason why I love it. There's worker placement in this game, there's die rolling, you have different characters with different special abilities, you all feel unique, you all feel like you're contributing to the group. What can I say? This game is so deserving of all the hype that it has. I want to play it more and more and more. There's a fantastic new expansion out, or at least it looks fantastic. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, called The Voyage of the Beagle, that just adds so much content to the game. I can't even fathom it, because even just the base game will keep you busy for, I have to imagine, hundreds of hours. That's the type of game this is. I urge you to check it out, because it is such an experience of a game. Easily my number 10 game of all time, Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island from Portal Games. But I gotta give you a negative. Dark Knight says, garbage, highly desired garbage. At its heart, an overly fiddly dice roller, screwy enough rule book that the forums are overloaded with, does the X go before the Y? Ugh, so glad this piece was in high demand almost made up for my Trajan to Evo debacle, money-wise. Okay, my number nine is one of the out of left field entries that I hinted at. And even I had to take a moment and think, wow, is this really high up, this high up on the list? And then I thought, yeah, a resounding yeah. I love this game and I can't stop thinking about it and I wanna play it more and more and more and I want more of the game but that's kind of a difficult thing. My number nine is Heart of Crown from Flip Flops. And if that all sounds very confusing to you and you've never heard of it before, that's because this is a game that is only out in Japan and has not been released over here yet. You have to track down a copy, put English pay steps on it, which you can easily find on Board Game Geek, and then enjoy. It is a labor of love to put this game together and start playing it because it is one of the best deck builders I've ever played. Not the best, spoiler alert, but it's so cool because I'm always looking for deck builders that do something different, that put a unique spin on the Dominion slash Ascension style of deck builder that we see so much of. This one mixes together elements of those two games and some other games, but puts a whole new spin on it. 
You have this, the way the starting lineup works is really weird because it's kind of like Dominion, it's kind of like Ascension. You have to vie for control of these princesses, which not only give you special abilities, but they also start a kingdom. Another, like a sideboard of cards where you put your victory point cards and even some cards during, like action cards you can stow away during the game to use on later turns. And then at that point, it's a race to get as many victory points as possible and meet the threshold of points in order to win the game and have your princess be coronated. So it's like a weird two-tiered game. First get to the princess, then start stowing away points in your kingdom. It's just so cool. There's different, there's lots of different unique things about the game. The way that you chain cards together, the way that attacks work, it's very interactive for a deck builder. You're constantly interacting with the other players. Turns go quickly. Oh man, it's so solid. It looks great. I love the artwork. It is anime style, but it's actually kind of like a almost Miyazaki style anime style. So that's really what I like about it. This is a great game. I can't believe it has not been released over here yet. I can't believe there's so many other Japanese deck building games that have been released here and not this one. Because, in my opinion, there's only one that is better than this game. And this one could easily overtake that other one soon. Keep your eyes peeled on my channel. But Heart of Crown is a solid game if you can find it. Easily my number nine. However, Nushura says, a blatant copy of Dominion, where all differences were artificially created. This is like Dominion, but different, because this rule is instead implemented in that way. The only new addition is the idea to represent the plus actions as with visual arrows. Stay away from this one. Don't listen to him. My number eight is a very new game. It's one of the very new games that I hinted at at the beginning of this segment of the list, and that is Imperial Settlers, also from Portal Games and also from Ignacy Trebichek, although this is a very different game than Robinson Crusoe. Actually, it's based off of a couple of his earlier designs, uh, 51st State and New Era. Now, I played the New Era and didn't like it. I thought it was a little bit too complex for me at that time in my gaming life and just a little bit too dry. I didn't like the graphic design or the theme or any of that stuff. But Imperial Settlers, to me, feels like an improved version of that game, a much improved version of that game. This does something that I love in games. I love card games in general, but I love it when you can use cards for multiple different things. And in this case, what you can use the cards for is super cool because you can build a civilization with them. You build all these different locations, either gener generic locations that give you lots of resources and production value, or uh, locations that are unique to your particular faction, which is another thing I like in games, factions that have different feels and different sort of strategies and gameplay uh, tactics to them. Or you can use these cards and raise them. You can destroy them to get bonuses that you might need right away and makes it worth destroying the card. Or you can make a deal with them and get constant production, but it's you have to decide when is a, a good point for you to do that, when to sacrifice the utility of having that card for a location instead. And on top of all this, the game just looks great. I love the graphic design. I love the, the little chibi characters on all of the cards. It's like a top-down view of what like a civilization video game would be like. Even all the way that the cards integrate with your player board looks cool because it's roads coming out and building these different sections of your empire it's such a wonderful charming game it's probably a little bit too heavy to be a, uh, a gateway game but people that have only played games like magic before really gravitated to this game and really really love it and it's easy to see why imperial settlers from portal games and ignacy trebichek my number eight however uh crazy leg says just really, really dull and a bit broken with the superpower that you may or may not happen to draw. As others have mentioned, there is a way to each there is a way to play each race and it's too restrictive. The cards are too cheap, especially the superpowered ones. The text is too small. The gameplay too repetitive, especially during the kill me now later rounds, and it's just gen generally boring. Nice artwork. That's about the only thing going for it. My number seven is the other game that I had a feeling people would be like, huh, how is that game so high on the list? And it's also the game I hinted at when I said that there was a deck builder higher than Heart of Crown and is therefore my favorite deck builder, and that is Tonto Kore. Yes, the Tonto Kore, the infamous Tonto Kore, which has you taking control of maids and putting them in your private quarters and all of this innuendo. Well, really, the game does not have much innuendo at all, except what you put into it as the players. I guess if you're a big anime fan the way that I am, then all this is just a very tongue-in-cheek joke that you don't take too seriously. Obviously, some people take it a little bit too seriously and have let it affect their opinion of the game. But if you actually give the game a fair chance and play it, it is the 
best Dominion clone out there. And in fact, I will say that it has taken what Dominion has wrought and made it better. I like the interaction that this game provides, and I like that every base set of the game, which are expansions for each other as well, has added an incredibly unique and cool mechanic to it. Especially the last set, the Romantic Vacation set, which still sounds funny to say, which added the whole reminisce cards and having to do certain card combinations from your hand, discarding those cards in order to get these really powerful effects. There's so many cool aspects to this game, even in the base set where you can, uh, you can put your maids into your private chambers i know giggle giggle and how they still give you points and special abilities but you can actually interact with the other players by inflicting them with illnesses that make them lose points or lose their special abilities all of these different things make it just a better game for me than so many of the other dominion clones including dominion itself and i like the artwork and it's just appealing to me and i just love playing it it is a solid mechanical deck builder not as thematic as some of the other deck builders on my list but mechanically speaking, as far as I'm concerned, it's unimpeachable. I love it. I can't wait for the new Oktoberfest set to come out, which is going to have maids and beer. How can you go wrong? Tonto Quarry, my number seven game of all time and my favorite deck builder of all time. However, Los Shabas Dragon says... The whole theme is distasteful. Okay, a lot of employers must have lusted for their employees, but to make a whole game with such a game where everything evolves about this? Only for Ponsu Pedo Fetishists who might want to cover their fetish with a capital F. My number six game of all time is Shadows Over Camelot from Days of Wonder. This is not only one of the best cooperative games I've ever played, but it was one of the first co-op games I played that had the traitor mechanic, the infamous traitor mechanic. And this one, even though you can call it, say it's a bit dated and you know, Battlestar Galactica came out after this and now you have games like Dead of Winter, I still feel like this game is solid. It looks fantastic. The theme is really cool. You're all the knights of the round table and you're trying to root out the traitor that Mordred has placed within your ranks. And uh, at the same time, you're trying to do all these different knightly tasks like find the Holy Grail and fight the Black Knight and keep uh, the minions of Mordred and his like little uh, his uh, ballistas or whatever they are the uh, 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 catapults at bay all those different things and find the Holy Gra or find the Excalibur and uh, go and get the traitor Lancelot all of these different things you can do fighting a dragon and it looks so great and it's all portrayed with awesome artwork and great miniatures and yeah the gameplay is really just trying to put together sets of cards and full houses of cards and numbered sequences of cards i get that but really it's all about the social interaction accusing people and saying why are you doing that you're obviously the traitor and there's a possibility there won't even be a traitor at all it's a fun, fun game. It's always been a hit with the people that I've played it with. The expansion makes it even better, and I love it. I will always love it, and I'll play it every time it is brought out. Shadows of a Camelot from Days of Wonder, easily my number six. However, Cossack says, this is not a game. There are no real decisions to make, no problems to solve, not even a clever mechanic to enjoy. It is a, it is shameful, shameful how much hype this title has garnered, and it demonstrates an enormous gulf between gamers who wish to actually game versus those who seem satisfied with spectacle and atmospherics. If games were dates, this one is a dumb blonde. My number five is the last new, as in came out this year, game on this list. And it's definitely the most talked about. And it's probably not much of a surprise that it would be on this list, but that it's so high, maybe that'll shock people. Dead of Winter from Plaid Hat Games. This is an experience of a game. I said that when I was talking about Robinson Crusoe, and I feel the same way about this. Now, this is a zombie game, and in a way, you could say that this is the highest ranked zombie game on the list. Well, in a very real way, you can say that. But it's not really about the zombies. It's about the interaction between the players. I just talked about Shadows Over Camelot and how it has its traitor element and how you there's a suspicion of the group and you're trying to root out that traitor. This game puts a different spin on that, one that I think works a bit better, hence the reason it's one entry higher on my list, because everybody is doing something secretive and shady. You all have secret objectives that you have to meet. At the same time, you need to work together because you're in the middle of a zombie apocalypse in the dead of winter, uh, and you're trying to meet your main objective, which could be just fending off hordes of zombies or trying to cure the zombie uh, disease, whatever it might be, you have to work together 
but if you don't meet your secret objective, you will fail. And that sounds like such a simple mechanic, but it adds so much depth to the game. And of course, there is someone who has a betrayal objective who is trying to make the entire colony fail. And again, just like in Shadows, you may not have a traitor. You don't know. Is that person doing something suspicious because they're the traitor? Or is it because they just need to get their objective done and they're willing to sacrifice other people to get it done? Such a fascinating dynamic to the game. The game is gorgeous looking. I love the artwork. I love the mechanics. I love going to the different locations and the um, exposure die. Oh, so many cool things in this game. Really, this is going to be the game that puts Plaid Hat on the map for sure. It's going to be one of those evergreen games. It's already fantastic, and I love it. Dead of Winter, my number five game of all time. Uh, however, Linoleum Blown Apart, fantastic name by the way, says, This is the Terra Mystica of Ameritrash. It's an overhyped jumble of the genre's worst excesses. The game boasts innovative mechanics like Crossroads, just a random event card that someone else reads and watches your turn to see if your action triggers it or not. Dead of Winter solves the inherent brokenness of semi-co-ops by, uh, it simply doesn't. It's king making in a box and expects you to just play along and read the flavor text instead. Dig past those two issues and the gameplay is utter derivative Ameritrash of the Fantasy Flight Games Flying Frog kind. My number four is what I would term a modern classic. More and more people, it seems, year by year, seems to fall in love with this game, even though it is starting to get older. But I think this is going to be one of those games that maybe doesn't sell, sell the numbers of Ticket to Ride or even Dominion, but it's still going to be in a lot of gamers' collections. That is Small World from Days of Wonder and from designer Philippe Kiarts. Now, the thing about Small World is that it's a very simple game. You are just trying to take control of territory, and you do it by taking a handful of tokens, and if you have enough tokens, you take the territory. That's it. Maybe you make a chance combat roll for that last one if you don't quite have enough tokens, but it's very methodical. You kind of know what you're going to do. Where the joy of the game comes in is that you have all these dozens and dozens of different fantasy races each with their own unique power combined with another unique power so there's all this different variations tons and tons of different variations of powers that increase the replayability of the game exponentially and i'm not even talking about adding the expansions yet when you start getting into all the expansions that are available for this game it just opens up into something just completely different and unique this is, it's a beautiful game. I love all the artwork. I love how it looks. I love the theme. The theme is kind of light, but it is cool to think of yourself as like flying skeletons uh, traipsing across the land and taking out your, uh, your opponents like swamp dwarves or something like that. And the whole mechanic of putting a race into decline in order to get another race, but having your people still stay out there is really cool and adds a level of strategy to the game. I really love it. It's one of the first games that really got me into the hobby, and I love it more and more. And they still keep putting out expansions, so I'll keep buying them. Small World from Days of Wonder, my number four. However, Lyoko says, I usually love Days of Wonder, so I was shocked at how much I hate this. This game is painful, let alone boring. It's the board game equivalent of a Dementor, chipping away at my usual happy demeanor and leaving me feeling tired and depressed. I just don't get it. I've hidden the game at the back of a cupboard and I'm hoping my partner, friends, and family all forget about its existence. Yikes. My number three is Eldritch Horror from Fantasy Flight Games. Now, I'm not a huge Lovecraft guy. If you remember earlier on my list, I had Mansions of Madness, but I'm pretty sure that's the only other like solid Cthulhu game that I have on my list. I'm just not that attached to H.P. Lovecraft. I've never read his books. I don't really care about it that much. The theme seems cool to me fighting all these old Elder Gods, but I'll tell you what, the one most iconic board game version of the Lovecraft mythos that there is out there, Arkham Horror, I did not like. It was one of the very first games I ever got when I was into the hobby, and I was incredibly sad because someone got it for me as a gift, and I felt like I had wasted their money. I thought it was a boring slog, too many bits, too fiddly, just not fun, and after a couple of plays, I it quickly traded it away. So when Eldritch Horror was announced, I was like, Pfft. What, more of that? Was it just like a re-skinned version of it, slightly different from the other one? I am so glad that I tried it anyways, because this fixed every problem that I had with the original. Yeah, it's still kind of fiddly with a lot of different cards, but this one is not about bookkeeping, and it's not about just, you know, trying to... Uh, 
puzzle your way through a map with all these different things coming out on the board. This one is about telling a story and having these cool encounters and drawing a card and having to, you know, make tests and uh, fight against cultists and jet set around the world and find really cool items and it feels so much more like you're playing through one of these Lovecraft mythos stories and just having fun while doing it and even when you go crazy or when you have debt and the mob comes to get you and you're you're fighting Cthulhu and he's gonna kill you all it still feels like fun I love this game it is such an experience and I will play it every time even if it takes six hours every time but that's how much I love it, and that's why I'm willing to put up with it. Eldritch Horror from Fantasy Flight Games, easily my number three. But AZ Drugger says, just as bad as Arkham Horror, not even an original game. I don't feel like I'm doing anything in this game. I feel like this game is playing me, and I'm reading the result. There is no strategy to it. There are no meaningful decisions. The theme is cool, but show me a freaking HP Lovecraft game that has some meaningful decisions and some player interaction in it, please! Well, I did. It's called Eldritch Horror. All right, before I tell you what my number two is, for those of you that are going to accuse me of being a shill for the Dice Tower, I would remind you that I am not an official member of the Dice Tower Network. I just contribute to them, and that I am my own man, and I make my own decisions, and I like the games that I like. And so with that in mind, I declare that my number two game of all time is Cosmic Encounter. Now here's the interesting bit about myself and my history of Cosmic Encounter. The first, let's say two times that I played it, I didn't like it. I had bought the game on a whim because I had heard people like Tom say that they loved it so much and it looked kind of cool. Cool little spaceships and lots of really cool aliens. It seemed like a classic game. I was just getting into board gaming so I'm like Cosmic Encounter, I'm there, I'm going to give it a shot, it's probably going to be great, and I had a completely miserable experience the first two times that I played it. I, it was, I was just randomly pummeled down by the other players, I wasn't really trying to make alliances the way that I should have been, I didn't get the game. It's one of those instances where, the few rare instances where I didn't like a game, but afterwards I realized that I was probably playing it uh, wrong. And I held on to it for some godforsaken reason. I don't know why, but I did, and I'm glad that I did, because eventually I gave it another shot, and it was better. And it got better and better and better until the point where it is one of the most played games in my collection, because it is a hit with almost everyone that I play it with. I say almost because this is a love it or hate it game and there are some people in my group who hate it. People whose opinions I really deeply respect and who we have a lot of common interests with and a lot of other games that we commonly love but not cosmic. This game, people can just hate it because it is truly random. It's random which alien you get. It's random how their power works and the card draw of whether or not that you're going to have the right cards for an encounter or whether you're just going to get totally decimated. That's just how the game works. But man, I'll tell you, it's always been fun for me. I love the variability. I love the variety of different alien races. I love the artwork and the components in the Fantasy Flight version. And it's just so cool. The negotiation, the back and forth building alliances, there's no other game like it. I can't believe this game was made like over 30 years ago. It's so good. And Dice Tower or not, it's worth the hype. My number two game of all time, Cosmic Encounter. However, uh, uh, Jerry Von Kramer says, no matter how many times my friend makes us play it, no matter how many times Tom Vassell or Shut Up and Sit Down claim it is the best game ever, it still sucks. Unbalanced, random, not that fun. All right, it feels a little anticlimactic, but we're finally at my number one. And I never made it a secret as to what my favorite game is. If anyone asked me, I would tell them. And I've mentioned it several times on my channel. And for those of you that have stuck with my channel for at least a year, you saw my full review of this game where I went on and on and on about it at length because of how much I love it. And I thought with all the new games that I've played in the past year that maybe that would change, that there wasn't really anything that particularly special about the theme of this game, and maybe it would be overtaken by all these bigger grandiose games like Eldritch Horror and like Cosmic Encounter and like Dead of Windsor. But no, when I really thought about it, I thought, man, I never ever want this game to leave my collection and I will always play it and I love it. And the people that I play with who also love it, I've made such strong connections with those people bonding over this game. That is Seasons from Asmodee. 
when I first saw this game, I thought, man, it's just beautiful. Everything about it is just gorgeous. The chunky dice and the seasons track and the artwork on the cards, which to date is the most beautiful artwork I've ever seen. I love it. I love everything about it. There are so many of those cards, possibly every single one of those cards that I would love to get an art print on my wall of. But hey, guess what? The game is good too. I come from a background of playing a lot of competitive magic. That's what I used to do back in the day. I'm talking about back when like Ice Age was at first came out, even before that. I think I started playing when Unlimited came out. And that was my background. That's what I did for a very long time. And I stopped because I didn't want the collectible aspect anymore. It was a lifestyle game that I did not want to be involved in. But what I always loved about those games and what carries on today to all these other card games I mentioned on my list, like Imperial Settlers and like all these deck builders and Among the Stars, is building up combo, con, <laughs> combos and just having these different powerful effects kick off and key off of each other and building your engine and getting it going and just getting stronger and stronger and having more and more cool card effects. Seasons is that. It's not only that, you're doing a draft, which is another card mechanic that I love. That's the whole first part of the game. But doing that draft is setting you up for the rest of the game. You are starting your engine and then you're just carrying it out, reacting to what your opponents play, changing things on the fly, and then the seasons track. It's like there's several different games going on here at once, but they all mesh together so well. So you're card drafting, you're drafting dice, you're playing the cards that you have, you're building combos, you're getting resources, there's resource management in the game. The expansions add a ton to the game. It adds the Destiny die, which is totally fun. It adds these uh, sort of uh, overarching enchantments, which like, you can take or leave, but they still add some interesting dynamics to the game and just more and more card content coming in. You can play tournaments with this game and you feel like you might actually have a shot. You know what the real testament <laughs> to how much I like this game is? I lose it way more than I win. I think I'm really good at it because of how much I've played it. It doesn't matter. I still get creamed all the time, but I'll still come back. I still love it. I love this game. I can't wait for more content to come out. And I just, I don't know. What else can I say? If you haven't played the game, I urge you to give it a shot. If you like games like Imperial Settlers or other card-driven games, this is in that wheelhouse and it is my favorite one of those types of games. This is my favorite game of all time. I don't see that changing anytime soon, no matter how many cool zombie and fantasy games come out. It's got to be Seasons, my number one game of all time. However, I got to give the second opinion here. Even my favorite game of all time is not immune. And Yodi says, this game is shocking in every way. It is way too random. Massive downtime. Totally boring. Point go up and down with every action. Every card has same dull special ability. It's just awful. Well, that's it, folks. That is the end of my top 100. I'm not going to say too much more here because I'm going to do a little follow-up video with my closing thoughts where I'll just talk about some of the interesting observations I have and talk about how much fun I had with the list. So, see you then.